So Hazel, so Hazel Grace Lancaster has uh, just met Augustus Waters and has found herself uh, rather quickly in his basement bedroom. <laughs> a shelf at my eye level reached all the way around the room and it was stuffed solid with basketball memorabilia. Dozens of trophies with plastic gold men mid-jump shot or dribbling or reaching for a layup toward an unseen basket. There were also lots of signed balls and sneakers. I used to play basketball, Gus explained. You must have been pretty good. I wasn't bad, but all the shoes and balls are cancer perks. He walked toward the TV where a huge pile of DVDs and video games were arranged into a vague pyramid shape. He bent at the waist and snatched up V for Vendetta. I was like a prototypical white Hoosier kid, he said. I was all about resurrecting the lost art of the mid-range jumper. But then one day I was shooting free throws, just standing at the foul line at the North Central Gym, shooting from a rack of balls. And all at once, I couldn't figure out why I was methodically tossing a spherical object through a toroidal object. It seemed like the stupidest thing I could possibly be doing. I started thinking about little kids who put cylindrical pegs through circular holes and how they do it over and over again for months when they figure it out, and how basketball was basically just a slightly more aerobic version of that same exercise. <laughs> anyway, for the longest time I was just sinking free throws. I hit like 80 in a row, my all-time best. But as I kept going, I felt more and more like a two-year-old. And then for some reason I started to think about hurdlers. Are you okay? I'd taken a seat on the corner of his unmade bed. I wasn't trying to be suggestive or anything. I just got kind of tired when I had to stand a lot. I'd stood in the living room, and then there had been the stairs, and then more standing. That was quite a lot of standing for me, and I didn't want to faint or anything. I was a bit of a Victorian lady fainting once. <laughs> I'm fine, I said, just listening. Hurdlers? Yeah, hurdlers. I don't know why. I started thinking about them running their hurdle races and jumping over these totally ar arbitrary objects that had been set in their path. And I was wondering if hurdlers ever thought, you know, this would go a lot faster if we just got rid of the hurdles. <laughs> this was before your diagnosis, I asked? Right, well, there was that too. He smiled with half his mouth. The day of the existentially fraught free throws was coincidentally also the last day of my dual leggedness. I had a weekend whip between when they scheduled the amputation and when it happened, my only little glimpse of what Isaac is going through. I nodded. I liked Augustus Waters. I really, really liked him. I liked the way that his story ended with someone else. I liked his voice. I liked the way that he took existentially fraught free throws. I liked that he was a tenured professor in the department of slightly crooked smiles with a dual appointment in the department of having a voice that made my skin feel more like skin. <laughs> And I liked that he had two names. I've always liked people with two names, because you get to make up your mind about what you call them. Gus or Augustus. Me, I was always just Hazel. Univalent Hazel. So what's your story? He asked, sitting down next to me at a safe distance. I already told you my story. I was diagnosed when I... No, not your cancer story. Your story. Interests, hobbies, passions, weird fetishes, etc. <laughs> um, I said... Don't tell me you're one of those people who becomes their disease. I know so many people like that. It's disheartening, like cancer is in the growth business, right? It's in the taking people over business. But surely you haven't let it succeed prematurely. It occurred to me that perhaps I had. I struggled with how to pitch myself to Augustus Waters, which enthusiasms to embrace. And in the silence that followed, it occurred to me that I wasn't very interesting. I'm pretty unextraordinary. I reject that out of hand. Think of something you like. The first thing that comes to mind. Um, reading? What do you read? Everything, from like hideous romance to pretentious fiction to poetry, whatever. Do you write poetry too? No, I don't write. There, Augustus almost shouted. Hazel Grace, you are the only teenager in America who prefers reading poetry to writing it. <laughs> this tells me so much. You read a lot of capital G great books, don't you? I guess. What's your favorite? Um, I said. My favorite book by a wide margin was An Imperial Affliction, but I didn't like to tell people about it. Sometimes you read a book and it fills you with this weird evangelical zeal, and you become convinced that the shattered world will never be put back together unless and until all living humans read the book. And then there are books like An Imperial Affliction, which you can't tell people about. Books so special and rare and yours that advertising your affection feels like a betrayal. It wasn't even that the book was so good or anything. It's just that the author, Peter Van Houten, seemed to understand me in weird and impossible ways. 
And Imperial Afflictions was my book, the way my body was my body and my thoughts were my thoughts. Even so, I told Augustus, my favorite book is probably an Imperial Affliction, I said. Does it feature zombies, he asked. <laughs> no, I said. Stormtroopers? I shook my head. It's not that kind of book. He smiled. I'm going to read this terrible book with the boring title that does not contain stormtroopers. <laughs> he promised. And I immediately felt like I shouldn't have told him about it. Augustus spun around to a stack of books beneath his bedside table. He grabbed a paperback and a pen. And as he scribbled an inscription onto the title page, he said, All I ask in exchange is that you read this brilliant and haunting novelization of my favorite video game. <laughs> he held up the book, which was called The Price of Dawn. I laughed and took it. Our hands kind of got muddled together in the book handoff, and then he was holding my hand. Cold, he said, pressing a finger to my pale wrist. Not cold so much as under-oxygenated, I said. <laughs> I love it when you talk medical to me. <laughs> He stood, he stood and pulled me up with him and did not let go of my hand until we reached the stairs. Later, as I pulled up outside of my house, Augustus clicked the radio off. The air thickened. He was probably thinking about kissing me, and I was definitely thinking about kissing him, wondering if I wanted to. I'd kissed boys, but it had been a while. I put the car in park and looked over at him. He really was beautiful. I know boys aren't supposed to be, but he was. Hazel Grace, he said, my name new and better in his voice. It has been a real pleasure to make your acquaintance. Ditto, Mr. Waters, I said, feeling shy looking at him. I couldn't match the intensity of his water blue eyes. May I see you again, he asked. There was an endearing nervousness in his voice. I smiled. Sure. Tomorrow, he asked. Patience, grasshopper, I counseled. <laughs> you don't want to seem overeager. Right, that's why I said tomorrow, he said. <laughs> I want to see you again tonight, but I'm willing to wait all night and much of tomorrow. <laughs> I rolled my eyes. I'm serious, he said. You don't even know me, I said. I grabbed the book from the center console. How about I call you when I finish this? But you don't even have my phone number, he said. I strongly suspect you wrote it in a book. <laughs> he broke out of that goofy smile, and you say we don't know each other.